Good, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum here at the Institute of Politics. Um, my name is Nia Warren. I'm a junior studying government and African American studies here at the college, and I'm also a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the Park side and JFK Street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your phones. Great. Um, and please take your seats now and join me in welcoming member of the Student Forum Committee, Aziz Richardson. Hello everyone, my name is Aziz Richardson and I serve on the JFK Junior Reform Committee. I'm a sophomore in Dunster House, concentrating in government with the secondary in economics. The William Monroe Trotter Collaborative for Social Justice and the Institute of Politics presents this important discussion on the legacy of Cali House and the long legacy of reparatory justice movements for black Americans. A brief intro on the featured speakers and our moderator. A. Kirsten Mullen. A. Kirsten Mullen is a writer, folklorist, museum consultant, and lecturer whose work focuses on race, art, history, and politics. Mullen is the founder of Artifactual, an arts consulting practice, and Carolina Circuit Writers, a literary consortium that brings expressive writers of color to the Carolinas. She was a member of the Freelon at Jaya Bond Concept Development Team that was awarded the Smithsonian Institution's Commission to design the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Under the auspices of the North Carolina Arts Council, she worked to expand the Coastal Folklife Survey. As a faculty member with the Community Folklife Documentation Institute, she trained students to research and record the state's African American music heritage. Kirsten is a consultant on the North Carolina Museum of History's North Carolina Legends and Civil Rights Exhibition Projects. Next, Dreesen Heath. Dreesen Heath is a Tulsa-born reparations activist, compassionate collaborator, conscious facilitator, relentless organizer, and nimble strategist with an expertise in reparatory justice. Through movement and coalition building, Heath seeks to mobilize and support individuals impacted by systemic racism to enact transformative and structural change. She's testified as an expert witness before the US Congress and has provided testimony and commentary to municipal governments to advance reparations. Also, her expertise has been featured and, rep and represented in numerous local, national, and international organizations on radio and in documentaries and podcasts, including The Washington Post, NPR, CNN, PBS, ABC, The Guardian, among others. Heath also serves on the Advisory Council of the Truth Telling Project. Next, Dr. Mary Frances Berry. Dr. Mary Frances Berry is the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought and Professor of, Uni of History at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the author of 12 books, including My Face is Black is True, Cali House, and the Struggle for Ex-Slave Reparations. Professor Berry has also had a distinguished career in public service. From 1980 to 2004, she has served as a member of the US Commission on Civil Rights, and from 1993 to 2004, served as chair. Between 1977 and 1980, Dr. Berry served as the Assistant Secretary for Education in the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. She has also served as Provost of the University of Maryland and Chancellor of the University of Colorado at Boulder. Last but not least is our moderator, Cornell Brooks. Professor Brooks is the Hossa Professor of the Practice of Nonprofit Organizations and Professor of the Practice of Public Leadership and Social Justice at the Harvard Kennedy School. He is also director of the William Monroe Trotter Collaborative for Social Justice at the School's Center for Public Leadership and visiting professor of the practice of prophetic religion and public leadership at Harvard Divinity School. Brooks served as the former president and CEO of the NAACP, was a civil rights attorney, and even an ordained minister. Ladies and gentlemen, here are our featured speakers. Let me just begin with a word of appreciation to all of you uh, joining in this Black History Month program uh, this evening. 
I also want to express appreciation for the JFK Forum, the IOP staff, and certainly all the students, faculty, and administrators in the room. The genesis of tonight's conversation really comes out of a class that I teach called Creating Justice in Real Time, in which I had the great privilege of working with a group of students who took up the cause of vindicating a legacy, exonerating a history of a woman by the name of Callie G. House, who was a foremother of the reparations movement. And so in this moment, as we contemplate this, tonight's conversation, reparations, story, history, and democracy, I am delighted to be in the presence of three distinguished thinkers and doers who are working, working and writing on this issue of reparations. And so I express my appreciation to, to my students, uh, to my panelists, certainly to all of you who are taking up this conversation in a moment in which um, our country is really wrestling with the past as we try to come to grips with the present uh, and face the future. So with that said, I want to just begin uh, with a uh, question to, I assume Dr. Berry is on screen? I think I'm on now, if you can hear me. I, we can hear you, okay. I, I'm seeing someone else's name other than yours. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a moment of uh, some apprehension. First person, does that, does that look like me? I mean, do you folks think it looks like me? Can you see me? So, so Dr. Berry, I really wanted just to, to start with you um, and the, the story of, of Callie House. You wrote a book, uh, My Face is Black is True, uh, which struck a, a, a deep chord within me. If you could just tell us a little bit about uh, Callie House, who she was, what she stood for, what she represents. Okay, first of all, let me apologize for being late and getting on. I, had, I bought a new computer and I <laughs> sat down at the last minute to set it up and I couldn't figure out how to do it and nobody else was here and the cat didn't know how to do it. But anyway, I feel anyway, you. I'm glad I got on in time. I'm on, I think. Um, I so much wanted to be here for this. Callie House, I would want to just let you know that I think she's one, she was one of the most remarkable people I've ever uh, become acquainted with as a historical figure or even in the present. I mean, I can't imagine how a woman who had been a slave, uh, who only had uh, like a first or second or third grade education, <laughs> and in fact uh, can uh, raise uh, children, have her husband uh, die, and she's there being a washerwoman like a mother. And she gets this idea and starts this movement. Well, the thing that is so magical about it is that she was persistent. She heard about it in church. She got this idea that what we should do is sign up everybody who's been a slave somewhere in the government and ask the government, they'll keep records. And then if we ever get some money from the government for our reparations, then they will have all the names of everybody. Of course, she didn't get everybody's name, but there are a lot of names. And not only did she persist in the movement that she had, had members all over the country, uh, not just in the South, anywhere there were black folk. When we looked in the Marvy Garvey's papers, which I was on the board of editors of, uh, there were people who lived in New York City who, mm -hmm. who were part of the ex-slave pension uh, movement. And in fact, uh, the federal government said she had 300,000 at least dues paying members. Mm -hmm. Um, she didn't say that, you know, we make up a lot of things about how big our organizations are. Uh, but the government said that they had counted and she had at least that many. Maybe they made it up. In any case, uh, she persisted. She didn't know what I know from reading the records at the National Archives. She couldn't figure out why the government was hunting her down mm. and tried to stop the movement. They stopped it uh, because uh, white people complained that she was rallying up the Negroes. And they stopped it because uh, if the Negroes didn't get, as they called us Negroes then, 
if uh, Negroes didn't get the, any kind of money or pension, as she called it, from the government, they might go wild. <laughs> so therefore, they had to stop her. And they ended up uh, accusing her of fraud. And the fraud was that she was trying to get the government to do something for black people, for Negroes, and she should have known the government was not about to do anything. Mm. <laughs> for those Negroes, and she was misleading them into organizing and trying to get the government to do something, which we know, and you folks at Harvard know, that's what lobbyists do all the time, try to get the government to do something <laughs> that the government doesn't uh, want to do, and they get paid for it. Anyway, uh, she kept writing them and saying, what are you trying to do to me? I learned about the First Amendment in, the, in school. They told us about it. We have a right to petition our government, she said. I don't know what you're doing. Anyway, they accused her of fraud, had her convicted by an all-white jury uh, down in uh, Nashville Federal Court, and imprisoned her in the Jefferson City uh, Prison. The important thing to remember about that, three things to remember about Kelly House. One is, as I said, her persistence. The, uh, persistence. the other is that the movement continued even after she was put in, in prison. Mm. It continued after she, was, after she passed away, when she got out of prison. Mm. Because I found records of people who still had chapters of the uh, ex-day pension movement, and I had received information and materials from people whose relatives were in the ex-state pension movement. It was a rational program, uh, and if we ever get uh, reparations from the federal government, I think that those people who signed, their depend descendants, ought to get something. Whatever we do about uh, reparations to the federal government uh, for programs and for the wealth gap, which I support, uh, um, but um, I think that the people who are descendants of Kelly House's uh, members who put their bodies on the line mm. and were courageous enough to do this ought to get something. And I think she ought to be honored for the courage she showed and the sacrifices that she made and how she was willing, she said, to put her body and soul in this movement and she would die for it. Mm. Mm. Now, does that tell you about Kelly House? Uh, listen, um, you, you set my <laughs> heart to, to beating yet again. Um, I would encourage, uh, I, I know at Harvard we don't hawk books, right? Um, but I would encourage uh, all of you uh, to purchase a copy of this book. It is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And uh, for the students in the room, let me, let me note that uh, our students read uh, Dr. Berry's book, and we put together with Professor Ron Sullivan a posthumous presidential pardon petition, which is before the uh, White House and the Department of Justice uh, as we speak. So um, scholarship, uh, important scholarship, uh, is, is consequential. But uh, Kelly House was, is not the only foremother. So if we move forward a few uh, decades um, from the early uh, 1900s to later in the century, and think about uh, the story of someone else who you should think about, which is uh, Queen Mother Audley Moore. And I'd like to ask Dr. Mullen just to lift up uh, a biographical sketch. You know, why, is this, why is this woman, why is this leader um, so important? I'm happy to do so. I'm, I'm an independent scholar, but I'm not a PhD. Um, Neither am I. I'm, I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Please forgive me. Audley Moore, you know, speaking about the fierce determination of the politically active blacks in New Orleans of mm. her acquaintance in the 1920s, recalled, quote, we were not cowarded down. Mm. I want to invite each person here to make that your mantra. All right. So Kelly Guy House and Audley Eloise Moore did not shy away from reparations talk or from developing reparations plans for addressing the cumulative ef economic effects of racism in the United States. Both of these women understood implicitly that the federal government owed a debt to black American descendants of US slavery mm. and that it should be paid directly to the eligible community. Mm. In From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, William Darity and I argue that any true reparations plan must eliminate the nation's huge black-white wealth gap. Mm. Black Americans Descendants of U.S. slavery represent about 12% of the nation's population, mm -hmm. but possess less than 2% of the nation's wealth. We view the racial wealth gap as the most robust indicator of the cumulative economic effects of white supremacy in the United States. 
that figure has risen to $14 trillion, mm -hmm. or even uh, an average of about $850,000 per black household. The annual budgets of all 50 states and every municipality in the country combined is about $3.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. So only the federal government has the capacity to pay this bill. So how did the racial wealth gap come into being? Uh, federal policies produce and keep the racial wealth gap in place, starting with the legalization of slavery itself, basically a de facto affirmative action program for white Americans with a massive potential for profit making and continuing with the Homestead Act of 1862, which enabled 1.5 million mm. white households to build wealth through the acquisition of 160 acre land grants in the Western territories. This was land that had been occupied by indigenous people, completing the nation's colonial settler project. Those 1.5 million white households that were able to exploit this federal policy translate to 45 million living white Americans who are reaping the benefits of this free equity initiative today. Right. At the same time, recently emancipated blacks were promised and then denied 40 acre land grants starting with the 30 mile wide band stretching from the Sea Islands of South Carolina through Georgia to the St. John's River in Florida. Property that could have been made available for exclusive use of black families for homesteads as a form of restitution. Instead, the land was returned to the Confederates who had owned it formally. In the, 21st, in the 20th century, the federal government advantaged whites with the GI Bill subsidies for home mortgages and building enterprises mm. while actively disadvantaging blacks. Political scientist Ira Katz Nelson observed, quote, of the 3,229 GI Bill guaranteed loans for homes, businesses, and farms made in 1947 Mississippi, for example, only two were offered to black veterans. Mm. And in a partnership with municipalities and banking institutions, the federal government introduced redlining and restrictive covenants and authorized funds for interstate highways that decimated black residential and business districts while connecting white suburbs to new parks and commercial centers. The federal government's capacity in the creation and maintenance of the racial wealth gap is also reflected in the 100 plus white massacres of black people and the destruction of black communities, especially business districts, between Reconstruction and the end of World War II. In many, many instances, the federal government stood by when armed white supremacists normalized the brutal killing and the torture of blacks who were politically engaged or had attained some measure of financial prosperity. On June 1st, 2021, President Joe Biden took the unprecedented step of visiting Tulsa, Oklahoma to commemorate the horrific 1921 massacre executed by white terrorists. That savage attack left at least 300 black people dead and the once prosperous Greenwood business district known as Black Wall Street in smoldering ruin. No previous American president ever had acknowledged the Tulsa massacre. Many Americans are under the mistaken impression that racial equity initiatives and reparations are equivalent. Um, and maybe we have a chance to talk about that you know, toward the end. But I wanted to um, mention just something here about uh, some of the reparations programs that are coming on, the, the reparations programs that are, that are coming online. Some of you may be aware of, of Evanston, Illinois, uh, which has brought uh, to fore um, a, basically a housing voucher program. They've approved a total budget of $10 million to provide $25,000 uh, grants to black residents for home maintenance expenses or for the down payment on a house or a city. Or Asheville, North Carolina, uh, which has a program aimed at increasing minority participation in the business of the city. Amherst, Massachusetts, closer to here, has agreed to set aside $2 million over the course of a decade for a, quote, reparations fund to acknowledge the disproportionate racial harms uh, caused by drug enforcement. Hmm. And Boston City Council recently created a study commission to look at the question of reparations. Perhaps that study commission will recommend that an update be made to the circa 2014 Color of Wealth in Boston study hmm. conducted by the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University in collaboration with the Federal Reserve of Boston. The study found that, quote, while the median wealth for a white household in Boston is how much? What do you guess? How much? 125,000. Any other guesses? 435,000? It's $247,500 in 2014. All right. Um, what was the median value for a U.S. born black household 
in Boston in 2014? $8, what else? You had a, an exp what were you thinking? 3,000? Yes? 8,000? It is actually eight. Eight. Eight, eight, eight no zeros, eight dollars, all right. So let's say Boston did set out to eliminate the racial wealth gap for its community of eligibility. What do the numbers look like? Boston's black population is 180,657 people currently. Let's say conservatively that 100,000 of those individuals are black American descendants of US slavery. Hmm. Multiply that number times 300,000, a low racial wealth gap estimate. The city would need th $30 billion, that's 10 zeros, hmm. to eliminate the racial wealth gap for its eligible claimants. Boston's annual budget is only $4 billion. So if you were to declare the city's entire black population eligible, the bill would be considerably higher. These programs are mislabeled reparations and they will not have much effect on the enormous racial wealth gap. But who was Audley Moore? All right. So black nationalist Queen Mother Audley Moore, a black power pioneer and the face of the modern reparations movement was active for more than 80 years. She was born in 1898 at the tale of reconstruction Less than one year after Callie House founded the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association, Moore came close to being what we call a super centenarian, someone whose life spans three centuries, the 19th through the 21st. Yeah. Moore and her collaborators, quote, launched the campaign to demand reparations in New Orleans in 1955. She presented petitions to the United Nations in 1957 and 1959 demanding land for black Americans and billions of dollars in reparations. She lived through half a century of white terrorist attacks against black people, atrocities that uh, targeted politically active and financially successful black people. So her origin story, her mother, her mother, Ella Henry, was educated in France alongside the daughter of a wealthy white Francophile de Congi family. Um, so her mother was this, uh, this family's daughter's companion as a, uh, um, as Moore uh, later said, better a black child they could control than the poor whites whom they despised. Mm. Her mother died when she was five years old. Her father, St. Cyril Moore, an assistant deputy sheriff in New Iberia, where Moore was born, mm. had been run out of another uh, Louisiana town, Generette, for retaliating in kind against a white neighbor who had, quote, horsewhipped his young son. He would die before Moore reached adolescence. Moore's paternal grandmother, was the daughter of an enslaved woman and the white man who had raped her on the plantation. And her paternal grandfather, quote, was lynched for standing up to some white people who, quote, wanted his land. Mm. The mob then ran Moore's grandmother off the property, mm. causing her to, quote, flee for her life with the things they had on their back and nothing else, leaving their, quote, cattle and everything on the farm. So I've been working my way through the Alabama and North Carolina transcriptions from the testimony taken by the Joint Select Committee to inquire into the condition of affairs in the late insurrectionary states, also known as the Ku Klux Klan's uh, hearings. This is 13 volumes of evidence gathered from witnesses in North and South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and Mississippi primarily. The tragedy that befell Audley Moore's grandfather that ended with her family losing their farm, livestock, and farm implements home furnishings and the provisions they had acquired happened to many, many black families. One of them, Eliza uh, Lyon of Demopolis, Alabama, testified before the Congressional Committee that her husband, Abe Lyon, um, who was a, a radical Republican, was murdered in front of her and her children. Shot him with a double barrel gun, she said. A Dr. McCall counted 33 holes they shot in him. Mm. The Lions also lost $600, their life savings that mm. were in the house. Quote, I left my hogs and the wagon. We had paid $75 for that wagon and everything. When the Klan hearing committee chair, John Scott of Pennsylvania asked Lyon, well, who has your property? She replied, I just left it there. I suppose I never will get it. I am too afraid to go back. As a young child of five, oddly more herself, witnessed a lynching in New Iberia. Quote, I remember the hollering, she said to Cheryl Townsend Giles, whose interview is housed in the Schlesinger Library on this campus. Moore continued, quote, white men like wolves, and the black man's feet was tied behind the wagon, and he passed in front of my house. 
His head was bumping up mm -hmm. and down on the clay, the hard, crusty road, end quote. Moore and her family heard Marcus Garvey speak in 1920 in New Orleans. The previous year was the year of the Red Summer. That was when white terrorist attacks on black communities exploded across the country, not only in New Orleans, July 23rd, but also in far-flung sites like Bisbee, Arizona, hmm. July 3rd, hmm. New London, Connecticut, May 29th, and Longview, Longview, Texas, July 10th through 12th. The heroic military service of over 380,000 blacks during World War II had not brought about an end to disenfranchisement or segregation, debt peonage, and racial violence. White supremacy at home proved to be a more invincible foe than the German army. Blacks in Louisiana and elsewhere were desperate to bring an end to the carnage and the destruction of black property, but they did not have the capacity to make that happen. So Garvey's arrested. He's indicted on mail fraud, mail fraud charges in 1922, same as Callie House had been five years earlier. Right. Uh, and as, as uh, uh, Professor uh, Barry said, many of the pension relief branches that she had created became uh, UNIA chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 1923, Garvey began uh, the first two years of five-year prison sentence before being deported to Jamaica in uh, 1927, which was his home. Mm. So Moore was a lifelong Garveyite. She, saw, she said he opened her eyes to the importance of teaching black history in public schools and the wonders of African culture and the African continent, the land of the kings and queens and untold natural riches that had been plundered by legions of European colonialists over four centuries. She spoke out against the unlawful executions of black youth and men falsely accused of, quote, rape of white women. Mm. As a member of the Communist Party for reparations, I'm sorry, as a member of the Committee for Reparations for Descendants of U.S. Slaves, she penned a seminal document called Why Reparations in 1963, advocating redress for black American descendants of U.S. slavery. And she was a leader of the Republic of New Africa, that's Africa with a K, in 1968, fighting for self-determination, land, and monetary reparations. She developed political networks to lobby for integration, anti-lynching and anti-black <coughs> police violence legislation, job quotas, mm -hmm. and higher wages for black workers, and eventually reparations. Her name has been invoked by Pan-Africanists. She mm -hmm. embraced decolonization and freedom for Africa, and a Ghanaian chief bestowed the honorary title of queen on her in 1972. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of interesting that at the same point that she and others were advocating for black Americans to go to the continent, this is the period when Africans were coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At any rate, that's a, that's a topic for another, another forum. Um, she believed the federal government should provide funds to black Americans in the United States, including those who wanted to repatriate to the continent. But importantly, Moore appears to be consistent in arguing that reparations from the United States government should go to blacks whose ancestors were enslaved in the United States. Mm. Uh, last night, Professor uh, Danielle Allen shared that some members of her extended family left northern Florida for California, and I believe the 1930s, to escape discrimination. Uh, kind of an unusual migration path. Um, Audley Moore's family also searched uh, for a place yeah. free of racism. Their initial plan uh, to follow Gar Garvey's dictum and move to the African continent was nixed by a relative whose only knowledge of black Africans was the fictional accounts depicted in colonial era films. She had heard that blacks were free in, in, in uh, California. Black mm -hmm. people have freedom in California. But what Moore and her family found during their fact-founding trip were, quote, high prices and no color allowed signs. Mm. Sensing Moore's frustration, a, a Los Angeles resident shared, oh my dear, if it's freedom you're looking for, we could have told you. We have discrimination in California. But where you should have gone was Chicago. Our people are really living in Chicago. So Moore and her family traveled to Chicago, where they found, quote, all the black people shunted into one district, and the conditions there were worse than we had in New Orleans. Mm. Oh, they said, my dear, it's not here. Harlem's where you need to go. Wow. <laughs> now, she says, I didn't realize Harlem, too, was Jim Crow. We found for white signs, and many apartments was for white only. And mm. the theater in Harlem, you had to go upstairs in the segregated balcony. None of the stores would hire you. No blacks were hired on bus or streetcar drivers, and no one could find a job in their own neighborhood. Quote, black women stood on the street corners, and the Jewish women used to come almost just like slavery days, feel our muscles, look at their knees to see if they had crust on their knees. Mm -hmm. 
evidence that they could turn heavy mattresses and get on their knees to wax their floors, she recalled years later. So that was the condition, and I got into the movement. I started the movement. So after the Moore family moved to New York, she continued uh, her connections, maintained her connections to New Orleans roots, went home frequently and collected stories of hardship and loss and the occasional victories that black people shared. She began the work that would lead to what historian Ashley Farmer, who's writing a much anticipated book length biography of the fabled crusader calls her quote, pioneering role in forging the modern reparations movement. Mm. During the depression, she and her fellow reformers were engaged in the great struggle, she called it. We put the furniture back in people's houses after landlords put them out. Sick people and everything, it was disgraceful. Mm. Already relegated to the lowest paying professions, black New Yorkers experienced an unemployment rate of 50% in 1932. She organized some of the city's first uh, tenant strikes. She led the white-led, she joined the white-led international labor defense that had launched an unprecedented public campaign in 1931 to end Jim Crow mm. and support and defend the Scottsboro Boys nine black Alabama youth who had been falsely accused of raping two white women. Yeah. She signs up for the Communist Party. She served as their secretary of the Harlem section. She becomes the secretary of New York State Party in 1942. Uh, she even managed a successful campaign of New York City's first avowed black communist city council member, wow. Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Jefferson Davis, I love that name, Junior, <laughs> in 1942. But the Communist Party fought to get black nurses in the Harlem Hospital, she said, and black doctors in Bellevue Hospital. They organized against high, high meat prices, and she credited the party with teaching her about, quote, the class character of the society. But there were problems. Apart from Harlem section's head, James W. Ford, whose grandfather had been lynched, burned alive when Ford was young, and who this, the party had uh, run as its vice presidential candidate in 1932, 34, and 36, the New York chapter leadership was, quote, lily white. All whites in Harlem, she observed, the head of every important department was white. Other national commissions were given the authority to meet separately. Italians, mm. Jews, Romanians, Estonians, Finns, but the Negro Commission had white members. There had to be whites in all of our meetings. Mm. She would resign in 1950. Racist by the score. Racist, full of racism, she recalled. Mary McLeod Bethune recruited her to the National Council of Women, where she worked on job quotas for blacks, integration and housing discrimination, and defeating poll tax legislation. She made oh 10 God. trips to Europe in 1946 and 47 as an Army Civilian Corps member and escorted seven to 8,000 war brides and their infants who had been left behind by American GIs to the United States. She told the Chicago Defender who marveled, uh, that she marveled at the women's lack of race prejudice. Some of these women shared their anti sentiment uh, and their acute understanding of what it meant to be married to a black GI. Mm. One woman confided, she has married a Brooklyn GI, and already she knows that the Statue of Liberty means more to her than to me, a Negro, who brought her here. More uh, viewed white supremacy, Jim Crow, segregation and terror, political persecution, the oppression of black womanhood, colonialization, lynching, and black poverty as forms of genocide. These practices, she believed, represented a violation of universal, inalienable human mm. freedoms, such as the right to life, freedom of conscience, and the right of self-determination protected under the United States, United Nations uh, Human Rights Declarations. In 1963, in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, she launched and led the Committee for Reparations for Descendants of U.S. Slaves. The book published her 12-page treatise, mm. Why Reparations? Reparations is the battle cry for the economic and social freedom of more than 25 million descendants of American slaves, they declared. Mm. And this is very similar in tone to the Civil Rights Commission's 1951 petition. Mm. She was lionized by black nationalists, especially Black Panthers in California, and a host of African prime ministers and presidents. Mm. So there's still some work to be done. You know, many of the atrocities that Moore documented and worked to address have not been eradicated. Mm. She would have been surprised to learn that black America, she would not have been surprised to learn that black Americans have suffered greatly since the onset of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Mm. Nationwide, 146,108 blacks have died from COVID-19, mm. a mortality rate 1.7 times that of whites and twice the rate of Asians, who have the lowest coronavirus fatalities, 205 per 100,000, according to the Center for Disease Control. The black mortality rate is 457 per 100,000. In November 2020, when the death rate peaked blacks and Hispanics and American Indian or Alaskan natives were nearly four times as likely to die of COVID as whites. 
Finally, what if reparations had been paid in 2015 or 2010, before the onset of the pandemic? Hmm. In an experiment designed to look at racial justice interventions, Lancet commissioned scholars examine the social equity status of two disparate locations, hmm. South Korea and Louisiana, Audley Moore's home state, coincidentally. Hmm. They found there would have been a reduction in the ability of the disease to spread of 31 to 68 percent. That positive health effect would have been realized not only by blacks and distributed across all racial groups benefiting the population as at large. Reparations for black American citizens of U.S. slavery is long overdue, 157 years to be exact. The fight for reparations is not performative. Uh, it was not performative for more. In her 96th year, in 1994, during her last public appearance, still fighting, the legend urged, reparations, reparations, keep on, keep on. We've got to win. The mm. fight is for the creation of a democracy that will deliver what William Monroe Trotter affiliated student Jeremy Ornstein calls abundance, mm. abundance and restitution. Thank you. So you've invoked the, um, the spirit of both Queen Audley Moore and also Callie House. And Dreesen Heath, um, I don't think it would be um, an immodest statement of your work leading a coalition of some 700 groups and individuals who are working on reparations uh, now in this moment. If I can ask you to, to speak about that work, as it, particularly as it relates to your hometown, Tulsa, the subject of the massacre, and the fact that you, you're working with some of the elders, those who have survived. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, and it's just an honor and privilege to be with you all, um, and the evolution of this conversation, the fact that we're, we're able to share this mm. space today, um, and, and be seen having the conversation, not behind uh, hidden closed doors, although we have those conversations too. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to start with Tulsa um, mm -hmm. because uh, that's a place that I was born but didn't grow up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a descendant of the massacre, uh, but my young parents at the time, the community there, survivors who were still alive, there were over 130 something survivors still alive in the early 90s. Today we only have three living survivors. Mm. Uh, Mother Leslie Benningfield Randall, Mother Viola Fletcher, Mr. Hughes Van Ellis, 108, 108, mm. and 102. Mm. Wow. Just, just let that yeah. sink and um, still, still talking, still lively. Wow. Um, but life, life is taking its course, mm. right? And um, the perpetrators of the massacre uh, are, are invoking the strategy they've done um, for centuries to uh, circumvent reparations for black people in the US, which is delay and deny um, until death. And so uh, my work in Tulsa, um, you know Tulsa, as now this phenomenon has been popularized in uh, HBO shows and, um, uh, but there's real human stories beyond, be beneath that. Um, it, it's, it's no celebration, um, for instance, that, that President Biden came to Tulsa, right? It is a, uh, a very important moment that a president did come, and there were very clear demands around reparations and around the urgency around the survivors. Mm -hmm. um, but you have a story that, you know, you will hear about Tulsa, and you'll hear the names Dick Rowland and Sarah Page as the star of the story. Mm -hmm. However, oil was drying up right. in the oil capital Indeed. of the world, and um, Oklahoma could have been the first black state, right, with all black towns in Oklahoma, tens of black, all black towns in Oklahoma, and in the Greenwood District in particular, we're talking about 40 square blocks, over 11,000 people, a city within a city, living in this area, um, and not just the wealthiest black community, among one of the wealthiest communities in the country at the time. 
um, and we're talking about post-Reconstruction era mm. black wealth, mm. self-sustaining black wealth. And so that's a target. That's the target for the white folks in the surrounding neighborhoods who conspired with the city, the county, the state uh, to destroy this community, um, to massacre uh, its community members, right? Mm. The, the at least 300 number, Again, over 11,000 people occupied this space. Yeah. Now we all know. Um, mm. <laughs> those, those, those reporting numbers, um, which were originally, newspapers were reporting 16 deaths, 27. You'll see 27 a lot repeated. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it strikes me emotionally every time I, I speak about it because of how urgent the issue is. Um, and, and not just the massacre itself, but its aftermath. So not just the attempts to uh, destroy Greenwood and Tulsa's black community then, but the continued effort to do so. Mm. Um, post the massacre, after everything is decimated, city officials are, are conspiring to uh, make Greenwood a railroad site, right? They didn't even care about picking up um, black bodies charred in the street, they were like, Let's just, you know, bury them in unmarked graves and, and um, set up this, uh, this plan for the railroad, um, which was eventually curbed by uh, the community members. You had lawyers like B.C. Franklin in tents mm. um, in the winter because only the Red Cross would provide relief mm. um, while the state and the, and the city actually blocked relief efforts, including financial aid. Um, to Tulsa at the time, but then you have decades later with um, urban removal and highway construction, right, where there's another attempt to displace, to um, dishonor, uh, to sever cultural ties uh, in this community. And then you have present day, high profile police killings, mm. but at the, at the um, at underneath those killings, are underfunded black schools in Tulsa, and particularly in the North Tulsa area where a number of descendants of the massacre and um, related families have been displaced from the Greenwood District area to areas of North Tulsa where that's the most populous areas of black folks. Um, everything from exorbitant fees and fines to um, being stopped by the police at four times the rate than just south of the highway mm. uh, where white, um, more you know, affluent communities live. And so to bring us from, you know, you, we could talk pre-1921, <laughs> but then to bring us from 1921 to present day and the cumulative harms that have occurred, that have gone unaddressed, um, let alone, you know, the economic damage that has happened as a result of the massacre. What could have, what could Greenwood have looked like? Um, the Stratford Hotel, the two um, bustling hotels in Greenwood, why couldn't they be the Hilton's franchise today? They had the opportunity to, mm. um, but seeing that was enough. Um, to be decimated, and so here we are supporting um, that case, which is, there's um, been pending litigation uh, in the early 2000s. You know, you bring the likes of Johnny Cochran, the uh, Professor Charles Ogletree, mm -hmm. um, putting together these claims, right? The only claims ever fulfilled in the case of the massacre were two claims um, for white victims who right. stole um, <laughs> ammunition, guns and ammunition from the gun owner store. So the, I'm sorry, the claim, the claim was actually fulfilled right. for the, the owners of the gun shops. Mm -hmm. um, and these were the very people deputized by government officials to carry out and coordinate the massacre. Mm. Um, currently there is pending litigation to connect the fact that the massacre has happened and there has been a continuing harm that has created, you know, public health crisis in, in mm -hmm. um, Tulsa where you have, you know, you still don't have a hospital in right. North Tulsa area. 
Um, and these are, you know, the descendants of the Tulsa Race Massacre especially. Um, I mean, I've had the a privilege to work with the survivors and work on bringing them to Congress and have their story heard um, a couple years ago ahead of the centennial. Um, but the descendants are also engaged at the federal reparations level um, because they understand that this is a specific case here, mm -hmm. but we have to be fighting and connecting with communities more broadly. Mm -hmm. So bringing together a coalition of organizations and individuals who have historically worked on reparations, who may not agree on the avenues <laughs> or, the, um, uh, or the mechanisms, um, but believe that there is an end point that we all need to get to. There is a repair process that needs to happen um, and uh, are committed to not just organizing at the federal level, but looking at their, their own specific harms that have happened in their community. Um, we have descendants who are uh, uh, of lynching victims mm. um, in, in counties in Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, we have um, folks who um, are descendants of, of uh, North Carolina eugenics survivors who are part of this coalition. Um, we have Japanese Americans who have received reparations, their families who have received reparations, um, who are you know, fiercely advocating um, for repair mechanisms um, at different levels. And so you know, my, my approach to this work and I've studied and researched a lot in the international human rights law space, which, you know, really, the, the repair mechanisms have been dictated specifically by the community for which it's been, for which have been impacted. Um, and I think that often the human part of this story often gets lost sometimes um, mm. in even my analysis and calculations of, of the harms, right? Because you have not just economic harms, but psychological harms and mental harms and political harms that have continued the disenfranchisement of black people in this country today. And so when we talk about even questions about democracy, right? Democracy, the unfinished project of democracy, what, is, what does that look like um, when a full reparations program, including the financial component, needs to be administered in order for there to be any actualization of a reckoning of democracy, of racial justice. Mm. You know, one of the things that uh, I think strikes all of us is that uh, there's this ongoing call for a conversation about race without a reckoning with race, right. tangibly speaking. And as I'm listening to, to all of you, um, I'm hearing a refutation of two, uh, two concerns about reparations. Uh, the first of which is that the harm occurred a lo too long ago, right. right? And implicit in that criticism, as in the harm occurred so long ago that there's nothing we can do about it, is that there, there was no one asserting claims mm -hmm. to reparations. So, you know, uh, Dr. Berry, I, I'd like for you, if you could, uh, just very briefly so we allow some uh, time for questions, uh, speak to the litigation that Callie Howe supported, right? So when, when we think about someone who was a uh, widow, uh, not a graduate of the Harvard Law School, uh, but who has a very interesting theory uh, with respect to litigation for reparations, uh, and the cotton tax. If you could speak to that uh, quickly, and then I'm gonna turn to our two guests and very quickly, and, and then to the audience for a few questions. I'm gonna do that, and um, it won't take me long to do it, because um, I, I'll do it quickly, because I wanted to make two other points, because mm -hmm. it's something they both said. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to do that while I have the microphone, because I didn't talk as long as they did. Mm -hmm. Any case, mm -hmm. I enjoyed it, but I didn't. Uh, l let me just say that what Callie House did is, after they had been put under surveillance by undercover government agents and they hadn't found anything, nobody that was doing anything except signing petitions or getting other people to sign them they couldn't write, mm -hmm. uh, and arguing about it and she was sitting and listening, they couldn't find any criminal activity. So they uh, thought that, as I said, that she was going to run the Negroes wild. So they. Uh, 
um, it, they issued an order that they couldn't send any flyers or any other information in the mails, which meant that she had to travel more. She had to send things by railway express. It was mm. expensive. People couldn't keep in touch. Hmm. And she was afraid that morale was going to uh, diminish in intensity. So she said, what could we else could we do? You know, you can ask the government, but you can also sue the government. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is get a lawyer to sue the federal government. And it was the first federal lawsuit on reparations in 1915. And she got Cornelius Jones, who was one of two black lawyers who had argued cases before the Supreme Court by that time. And he was well known in the black bourgeoisie circles and so on. Not like Callie House, who was the poor washerwoman, barely educated, that they disdained and wouldn't write about in the papers. The white press wrote about it, but not so much the black press. So when Cornelius Jones agreed to take this case, it got all over the press. The black press had him on the front page that he was going to take this case. She didn't, they didn't even mention Callie House as if she was nobody and had nothing to do with it. Anyway, he told her, you may not win because there's a theory that the federal government can't be sued unless it permits itself to be sued. It's had a big name, sovereign immunity, immunity. Mm. But he said, we have a shot at getting a lower court decision, which will be historic and which will boost morale. And we even have a shot on appeal. We might get something, but, but don't expect it. But let's hope we can win the lower court. And so they did. He brought the case charging that cotton that she had read about in the newspapers. It was all over the black newspapers. That Confederate cotton had been uh, uh, taken by the federal government and uh, the, the treasury had it. And they were thinking about giving it back to the Confederates <laughs> after the war or they didn't know what to do with it. And it said how much money was involved, thousands of dollars. She said, well, black folks, Negroes picked that cotton, the <laughs> slaves, and we picked it, and that money ought to go to try to pay some kind of reparations for us. So ask them for that specific money, hmm. a specific fund. And she, he did that. And in the lower court, he won the case. The, the, the uh, judge didn't argue with him about the justice of the cause or whether it made any sense. And he decided that he won um, the, the case. Uh, then, of course, it was appealed. And on appeal, they lost because the court, the federal court, decided that you cannot sue the government. It didn't say anything about whether the cause was just. You cannot sue right. the government if the government doesn't want to be sued. <laughs> so therefore, you lose. What it did, though, is boosted morale. It made Cornelius Jones a pariah with the federal government. They got after him, tried to find something that he wasn't doing to try to harass him. Uh, and he had to suffer that. But I think it, uh, it showed that the cause itself had some validity. Mm -hmm. It was just that there was no procedural way. And the later lawyers who brought these reparations cases took this into account. But the points I wanted to make are these. The first is, while I agree with the uh, wealth gap analysis that uh, my good friends, Derek and Mullen, have done, uh, I for the national government, I believe we have to ask for reparations for descendants of, Af of slaves here in the United States. Because the federal government, if it ever gives us reparations, which I doubt that'll happen in my lifetime, that in fact they're not going to give it to people who are from some other country or were slaves someplace else. Those people should get uh, reparations, but not from our federal government. As for local causes, whether it's in Tulsa or whether it's in California or wherever it is, I encourage local people to try to do whatever they can in the meanwhile without detracting from the national struggle, which mm. is ongoing, and the wealth gap argument and all the rest do whatever they can do so that incrementally they might be able to do something where they are. And the last point I'll make is on Tulsa and on Oklahoma. Hmm. I spent years when I ran education in federal government stopping the state of Oklahoma from closing down Lincoln University, uh, the, the black university in, in Oklahoma. They were going to close it down and turn it into a prison. They said, we need a state prison. <laughs> Let's close it down. That makes a nice facility for a prison. 
and I had beat them to, to death with my uh, rhetoric and finally in the publicity and finally they decided that they would keep their place and that they would even start a branch in Oklahoma City. So those are the points I wanted to make. Wow, thank you. That, the, the, that is such a, a, a powerful through line um, from Callie House to the, the present efforts to, to seek reparations. I, I hear um, a certain tension uh, in that, uh, Ms. Mullen, you, you lifted up the fact that with respect to reparations, if we respond to the racial wealth gap, uh, there are insufficient resources at the municipal and state level. But I also hear uh, Ms. Heath speak about these local efforts around the country that may well be driven by the, by the desperation of people to respond to the repertory need. How do you square those two? Do you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, I, I mean, I think um, <clears throat> harm, there is a clear harms that have been perpetuated by the federal government. Um, and there are clear, also localized harms perpetuated by local governments um, sometimes with the hand of the federal government, right? right like right. when we get down to the nitty gritty of the highways, most of those were 90% right. federally financed, right? And so we can, we can get to that. But specific zoning codes, you know, that interacted um, with other state laws, right? That is a localized harm. Um, how you address that should be proportional to the harm that's committed and then should be accessible, it should be an accessible remedy to the victims, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've brought up Evanston a, as an example and the majority of black residents in, in Evanston who uh, would, would need some remedy actually rent, right? And these monies cannot be uh, actually used, the, the $20,000 grant can't be used towards maybe paying up your rent for a couple years, right? And so... And these are black homeowners who've experienced legacy discrimination, which depreciated their, their home values, right. uh, decapitalized their neighborhoods, and so much so that we have more renters, right, right than owners. Than so owners. in terms of this local repertory effort, right. um, we have a, a paucity of victims uh, who can who, who can reap the benefit? Correct. Ultimately, uh, you know how how I see it, and how I've spent time in so many of these communities, listening mm -hmm. to people who have been harmed and what they want, right? And they want a federal reparations uh, program, and they also want, you know, sp sp they have specified specific harms within their community perpetuated by you know local leaders. Um, in conjunction maybe with uh, comp private companies. Okay. Um, and they've identified that as a separate harm that they feel needs to addre be addressed. So they've identified a, a, a se separate harm, uh, local, uh, close to home, uh, uh, easier to advocate for, but when they read, when ordinary people read uh, from here to equality, right. uh, they read the great book that uh, you and your co-author have written and, and and hear the price tag of trillions of dollars, mm -hmm. right? Um, Which some people say is low. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whether high or low, is it attainable as a matter of advocacy? Well, we certainly know that the United States has the capacity to pay a debt of that okay. size. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just look at recently, right. um, you know, at the money that was uh, immediately made available for the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm or when we bailed out the banks. Um, taxes didn't go up, um, and the United States paid those debts. Um, and we certainly have examples where the United States has paid reparations. Um, you know, uh, Ms. Heath mentioned Japanese Americans who received uniform payments of $20,000 each uh, for the victims who were unlawfully incarcerated during World War II. And people say, oh, well, $20,000, that doesn't sound like much, but um, you know, these are, uh, in many cases, families that were, you know, four to six individuals. And, um, you know, if you, um, if you uh, look at what that money would have been, uh, you know, worth today, you're talking about forty or $50,000 uh, right. per individual. And so now you're talking about several hundred thousand dollars for a family. 
Um, and more recently, uh, I think many people are not even aware that the United States paid reparations to the American hostages in Iran. These are the folks who were held hostage um, in 1979 and 80. Um, and they received, and the United States was not even the perpetrator. This was not, this is not a case where the United States was at fault, um, technically. Um, but those individuals received $10,000 per day of captivity from the U.S. government, yeah. an average of $4.4 million each. So we have the capacity. The question is, do we have the will to do it? Yeah. And I think, you know, I am really encouraged by conversations like this. Um, you know, this conversation has been sustained for quite a while. I mean, we right. have short attention spans in this country. And yet we have been talking about reparations for, you know, year over year over year. Um, I think it's interesting to note that in um, 2000, um, only 4% of white Americans thought that reparations, cash payments for black Americans was a good idea, 4%. Mm -hmm. 16 years later, that number had jumped up to about 16%. Um, two years ago, it was 30%. And at that point, almost the majority of millennials right. thought that reparations should happen. And so now we're looking at a number that is slightly over 30%. Now, this is not a majority, um, but the trend is moving in the right direction. Mm. And I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know if it will continue to move in the right direction, but I'm very encouraged uh, by those statistics. I think it's also interesting to note that at the point that uh, Germany made the decision to pay reparations to the victims of the Holocaust, only 21% of Germans thought that that was a good idea. Yeah. And Germany is still paying reparations to those victims yeah. to this day, as is the United States. And I, as I recall, with respect to Japanese Americans, the letters coming into Congress were overwhelmingly against. That's right. Uh, even even on, the, <coughs> on, the, on the second effort with respect to um, according Japanese Americans reparations, because there were two efforts. Um, I want to open it up for uh, questions. And uh, we have two mics. And as is the tradition here at the uh, JFK form, we ask that you append a question mark to the end of a statement uh, briefly stated, <laughs> um, and that the question uh, end as a question. Lash, please. Hello, uh, my name is LaShira Nolan, and I am I'm sorry, LaShira Nolan. Oh, the, the government Dr. name. Dr. LaShira Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I am an MD and PP dual degree student here at the Kennedy School and Harvard Medical School. And I'm very interested in the idea of medical reparations. And the reason why I'm curious about it is because even after we get the funds from reparations from the federal government, my fear is that so many of us will be stuck paying off bills, for example, medical bills, mm. from the effects of systemic racism and how that will then be funneled into a system that, of course, is rooted in white supremacy. So I guess my question is, what might the role be of institutions that continue to be rooted in racism, what might their roles be in, in reparations? And if we can expand the idea of reparations to include those institutions as well, instead of just payments. Hmm. If I could turn to Dr. Barry first, since you're on screen, if you're still on screen. Yes, um, the answer to that question, I think, is a lot of institutions already, universities, for example, trying to figure out, I guess Harvard has a committee too, uh, trying to figure out what reparations they owe. I know at Penn we have a committee, and, and Brown, I guess, was the first one of the Ivies that did it, trying to figure out what is it we owe, <laughs> and what evils did we in particular perpetrate? Mm. Uh, and they were evils. Um, and so I think that that process should go on. I think that the medical thing, we just had at Penn the whole thing about the remains of the move victims in Philadelphia mm. that had mm. been taken over to one of our labs in, in anthropology. And it's still over there with people playing around, analyzing them and, and, and doing whatever they feel like without the consent of the people uh, who's, uh, who are the descendants. There are lots of things like that that institutions should have to respond to. We all know the story about the woman in Johns Hopkins. It's been a movie and everything else and what happened to that family. Uh, but I think that, yes, we should continue. I guess my answer to it, yes, medical institutions should be 
called to a task. Uh, but I also think that if we, we must do that at the same time that we still push for the national reparations program. That's it, you gotta do both of them. And we, we gotta attend to what you can do locally and what you can do institutionally and get institutions to do. And it's going to require protests. And then it all started because the students, the, the students were the ones who pushed <laughs> making the university do something. And there are other places where this has happened too. So it can happen at Harvard if it happened there. They can come after Penn instead of coming before. And, and I'm all for that. Uh, the other thing is that I said earlier, I was talking about Oklahoma and I said Lincoln. I meant Langston University, obviously. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean Lincoln. I, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln <laughs> must have been on my mind. Um, so I'm for doing both and, and also the national program. Think about how long Callie House, how long ago she started that yeah. and how long that has been an issue. It's gonna take time, especially when we have, a lot of black people are against reparations right. of any kind. I go to forums where I get up to talk and people get up in the audience and say, well, I, I'm doing all right. I don't see why we need reparations or you have a TV show and you're on it and they bring some guy on who talks about how life doesn't need that and how we won't be motivated if we get reparations. So we still got a lot of people to convince, but uh, we don't have to, as Ms. Mullen pointed out, we don't have to dissuade everybody. <laughs> But we have to keep uh, pushing. Hmm. Thank you. I'll, please. Yeah. Just to offer a few more thoughts to um, Dr. Barry's great thoughts. Um, on the, we, we invoked the um, Germany's Holocaust reparations program, which includes end of life care for a number of um, victims and their descendants. And you know, in the United States, um, under Medicare, uh, black families pay at least $7,000 more for end-of-life care, right? That, to me, that should be free, right? I'm, I'm for ordering everything on the menu. Um, <laughs> I don't think that I have, we have to choose, um, but it has to be adequate, right? And so when I think about also the Chicago police torture survivors, in their case, where a trauma-informed care center a um, uh, medical center was set up to address uh, both trauma impacts of the individuals um, who were tortured, but also their families, extending that care, knowing that trauma is intergenerational and is communal, is experienced communal. Um, and so when I think about your question, I think about some of those mechanisms as well that need to accompany um, the full financial payment. Mm. I want to add something too, if sure, I may. Please, um, please. You know, I think it's important that we not underestimate the power of an eight hundred fifty thousand dollar per household reparations payment. Um, you know, you would you know be able to afford quality medical care. Um, you know, to live in a neighborhood that had the kind of amenities that you desire. You know, good quality schools for your kids, parks. Um, to be, you know, the, the ability to be able to send your kids to uh, you know, private schools if you chose, or to move into school districts that you desired, but also you would also have the opportunity to participate in the political life in this country in a way that you couldn't before, because you could contribute to political campaigns yeah. and vote out the people who are, you know, uh, crucifying us with these insane medical expenses. Um, you know, we had the offer of, a, of an equitable medical plan, but that was shunted away. Mm. Um, but, you know, let's not, you know, let's not forget that money talks in this country. And, you know, we're not, people say, oh, you know, you all are against people having money. No, we're not against people having money. We just think more people should have it. Mm. <laughs> mm. You know, I'll turn to um, the last question. I, I just have to note parenthetically, um, my colleague Linda Vilmos and I are uh, working on a paper that uh, describes just the, the, the sophistication of the federal government in identifying victims, mm -hmm. calibrating responses to racial and non-racial harm to the tune of millions, billions, and beyond, right? So in other words, this whole notion of reparations 
is often couched as reparations for black people being exceptional and aberrational, right. when we think about reparations in a non-racial context, is actually regular and routine, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, last question. Hi, uh, I'm Leonardo from uh, HKS. I want to push a bit further on the reparation. I've been, I'm a lay, lay person in this topic, but I've been learning that in HKS and reading from the history of the uh, enslaved people up until now, I felt like it's actually beyond reparation. I mean, I can't imagine what kind of reparation would, would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. But then if we try to imagine a bit, like envision a bit, what kind of reparation would, do you have in mind? I mean, if there is no constraint, I mean, this is like utopian thinking, what kind of reparation? you think would be enough. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious because whenever I read about, you know, what happened, uh, I lose my words, really. Uh, what, could re what could possibly repair? But if we were go, I mean, if you, you are in this field, you envision, what would that be? Is it the $850,000 per family? Uh, you have also mentioned about um, probably like s uh, support in terms of mental, etc. We know that the effect of lynching, for example, to the family, it will go towards generations and generation. What kind of preparation that without constraint you will deficient envision, mm. basically? Mm. So in the work that William Darity have done, you know, reparations could take a number of forms. Um, you know, we are very keen on the idea of a portfolio of assets, for mm. example. So people say, oh, well, if you give people a lump sum, you know, in 24 hours, they will have spent it all. Mm. You know, you know, a, a mountain of, of Air Jordan tennis shoes, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and it's fascinating to me that we don't necessarily say that with other groups. You know, I don't, you know, in all the research I've done, looking at Japanese Americans who receive reparations, I've never seen anyone say, if you give them $20,000, mm. they'll go out and buy what? you know, a field full of ginger. I don't know. I don't know what, what, what other kind of, you know, culturally offensive thing people would say. Mm. Um, so why is it when the potential recipients of reparations are black Americans of US slavery, why do we raise these questions? No one asks who the victims of the Holocaust, yeah. you know, no one asks them what will they do with the money. <laughs> now, that said, we don't have anything against reparations preparation, right? You know, if, if people want to uh, receive financial literacy, the federal government could offer that kind of instruction for individuals, but we don't think it should be required. You know, it wasn't required of any of these other groups before they received the, their checks. So I think it's important for us to question in ourselves, why do we put these quotation marks mm. around black Americans in terms of US slavery that we don't place around other groups? Mm. This is incredibly powerful. W w I see another question. You will have the, the, the very last question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, there are two questions. Okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> we'll take both questions and we'll take them together. I, I just, this is a really important point and the professor in me just wants to underscore it. The notion that you lift up, lift it up in terms of an asymmetry of uh, evidentiary burden. Black people happen to do more, prove more, right? right? But also an asymmetry of intention. In other words, we assume other people will be more responsible with reparatory right. payments than we assume with respect to black people. Th th that was implicit, wanted to make that explicit. Mm -hmm. So we'll take these last two questions and if you can say them both together, we'll present them to the panel and we will ensure that this panel ends on the same day it began, all right? Cool, <laughs> thank you so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. My name is Aaliyah Collins. I'm a third year at the Divinity School. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, with ongoing discussions around reparations for black people in the US, there seems to be a lack of discussion of where those impacted by mass incarceration, especially political prisoners, mm -hmm. who many are serving life sentences just for defending themselves against police violence, fall within this discussion. In your opinion, how do we bring the impact in the economically thriving business of mass incarceration into reparations discussion? Wow, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my question will be very brief. My name is Conrad Zielinski. I am with the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. And I would like to ask if you uh, see the issue of reparations only as a domestic issue 
or do you see uh, an option for maybe a global coalition for a wider movement that could raise awareness uh, globally uh, among many peoples, many nations, for the need for reparations for uh, victims of genocide who have not been compensated uh, so far, uh, despite many decades uh, since conflicts, wars, and, and genocides. And uh, if there, if do you see a chance for uh, such a global movement? Um, how likely do you find um, that uh, many uh, states, potentially across the globe, could uh, join in this uh, coalition to raise awareness? Excellent. Thank you. So this is incredibly unfair. We have two excellent questions. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to uh, allocate 90 seconds to 120 seconds of a response, starting with Dr. Berry. Okay, 90 seconds. First of all, there are already international coalitions. There is CARICOM, which is the Caribbean group, and there are groups in the OAS in Africa. There are people we already have, and most of them target their first uh, ask for uh, reconciliation and money to the colonial powers that exploited them. Mm. But uh, there could be, and there is the ma in the making, a global uh, coalition. I forgot what the first question was. With respect to mass incarceration, how do we? Ah, mass incarceration. The way you get mass incarceration into the discussion is if you want national reparations, and talking about the wealth gap and all that, if you ever think H.R. 40 is going to pass or something, you don't discuss mass incarceration, which is what the college board did when they took it out of the high school curriculum, which they did is in all the news today, after that governor down in Florida complained. They don't even discuss mass incarceration. I am putting it partly tongue in cheek because I think it should be discussed because many of the people who are there are unfairly where they are and should be out. And I would give them the same amount of money that it, once the Mullen and Verity calculated, which they've done, uh, that they would give anybody else. Mm. Turning now from the DeSantis rule for persuasion <laughs> <coughs> in terms of reparations, um, you all close this out in terms of responses. Well, one thing I wanted to say about mass incarceration, um, you were talking about you know, how to, to, to look at both of these, you know, both of these sets of problems at the same time. Mm -hmm. How do you move the needle in two directions? And I think mass incarceration and over-policing are definitely issues that folks can focus on locally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pr presumably there are good records mm -hmm. of what's happened. You can look at disproportionate sensing, sentencing of black people, what happened to them once they were in prison. So that I think is definitely an area that you know, communities can focus on in the, you know, in the form of racial equity initiatives. Um, the, the issue though, I think, of the coalitions, I, I would definitely agree with Professor Berry. Um, there, this is something that's happening already. Uh, although I, uh, just one warning, um, what our research suggests is that when you have multiple groups coming together um, with different agendas, even if they seem to be compatible, the kind of log rolling effect tends to bump the black, um, you know, black descendants of US slavery kind of out of the tent. Mm. And so I think it's really important for folks to, you know, th th you know we, we're very clear that that is the case that we're focusing on. Mm -hmm. you know, we absolutely agree that there are many, many groups that um, could make a claim on you know, various governments, Native Americans, for example, Mm -hmm. Tremendous claim on the United States government, uh, but you know when you're talking about black people from other parts of the world whose ancestors came here after the civil rights movement, you know after a lot of the hard work was done, you know who came here because of what they saw on the ground, who saw corporations, who saw public parks, who saw public libraries, um, they have claims to make on the nations that colonized and enslaved their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So you know individuals who are from Haiti would bring their claims to France, which was a curious case in that France forced Haiti to pay it reparations. Yeah. Mm. So not only should Haiti get that money back, mm. but they should get interest on that money and reparations, mm. right? Mm. But if you're from Antigua, from Jamaica, from Trinidad, that case should be taken to the UK. Mm. But we can all learn from each other, 
you know, I think it's interesting to note that CARICOM, this is the, 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 the organization that is pushing for reparations for people in the Caribbean, does not include black American descendants of US slavery in its claims, nor should it. But the reverse is also true. Mm. Black American descendants of US slavery should not be compelled to include other groups in their claims. Um, we were talking about Japanese Americans. Um, initially, the, um, the push among the Japanese Americans was to include all of the people of Japanese uh, uh, descent who the United States had kidnapped and incarcerated. And this included Japanese people in Mexico, in Peru. Um, but when they began to you know, get into the fine details of the legislation and talking to members of Congress, they realized that they couldn't make that happen. Mm. And the hope was that eventually we can go back and bring those individuals who were harmed into, you know, into this whole process. And that did happen. Um, they did not receive as much money. I think the, the, they received $5,000 um, grants. But you know, they recognized that they weren't gonna be able to make it happen at all if they didn't have this very specific definition. Right. You know, we don't have the same histories. We don't. Um, you know, all black people did not come here voluntarily. Some of us were brought here in chains. It's a very, you know, it was always kind of, you know, frustrating to me to hear people, Barack Obama included, saying, we are a nation of immigrants. Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, that suggests, you know, some kind of intentionality. That suggests some kind of choice, some kind of agency. Mm. But the black people who were enslaved here did not have that. And you cannot compare their circumstances with those of people who came many, many, many years later. Um, I mean, they could have gone to Scotland, they could have gone to England, they could have gone to Brazil, but they came here, right? And they came here for the advantages that this country, you know, uh, was able to provide for them. So I think it's important for us to learn our history. I mean, that's a big part of the lesson of all of this. I mean, we have, you know, Mary Frances Berry's work on Cali House, which was tremendous. If you haven't read it, please do. Um, but you know, we have learned and continue to learn about our history. I had no idea that 100 massacres had been committed in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's actually like 100 and counting. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, when I thought about Elaine, Arkansas, uh, I thought that was Red Summer. Mm. I had no idea that there were 36 and counting right. massacres that occurred in that single 18 month period. We don't know our history. Um, I grew up in Texas. And one of the high schools I attended had a Daughters of the American Revolution chapter. Mm -hmm. Heaven help us. And we had one of those textbooks that the DAR had approved. Mm -hmm. I think our history book was this thick. There may be six pages on black people, period. Mm. That was it. So, you know, we have a lot to learn. And um, one of the things that, that we are seeing is that when folks do learn more about the actual history, they are changed by it. I think it's one of the reasons why there's, I mean, we both say this, it's one of the reasons why this whole critical race theory, you know, boo-ha-ha, -ha, mm. is so, um, so heated, because a lot of young people are learning their actual history and saying, wait a minute, that's, that's right. not what, you know, what I grew up with. And they're, and they're wanting things to be different. Well, uh, as I, I'm gonna, turn for the benedictory note to um, someone who's leading uh, many of those young people uh, in terms of coming to grips with their history. Absolutely, I mean, uh, again, um, under, under international law, e even acts of uh, racial discrimination um, are, can receive remedy. Um, and so when we have this conversation around reparations, um, Again, I'm into the business of ordering the whole menu um, and recognizing distinct harms related to the institution of chattel slavery and also recognizing the harms of racial discrimination, the war on drugs, Jim and Jane Crow laws, black codes, um, you know, banking discrimination, et cetera, um, which impact all black people in the U.S. today. Um, and so I think we can have, you know, when we hash it out, we can have tears to um, addressing mm. all of these issues. Um, I'm, not, I'm not certain that we have to have one or the other. Um, I think we should demand it all because we deserve it all and we built it all. 
Um, and in the case of, um, you know, there are many organizations actually um, organizing around the impacts of mass incarceration and reparations. Um, that work is, um, you know, deeply personal. It's a, a number of families that are directly impacted by the carceral system. Um, and the, the key to that space is, you know, how do we guarantee <coughs> this institution does not commit the same harms um, again? And uh, we, we are seeing conversations around abolition specifically and the, you know, um, the, the dismantling of institutions that are anti-black, that are um, designed to keep these structures of you know, oppression um, in place. And so when we're talking about even reparation and this, this aspect of how do we ensure these abuses don't happen again, abolition has to be a part of that conversation. And let's continue to lift up um, the you know, coalitions internationally that have been organizing and continue to organize across country. Um, I would love to see you know, the continued energy it took an international coalition to you know, end parts of apartheid in South um, Africa. It, it, it should take that same fervor from all of us um, to join and end uh, the abuses against black people in the United States. Mm. Well, let me just uh, lift up a word of appreciation again to uh, the JFK Forum, um, to our panelists who I think have underscored the power of scholarship. So when we think about uh, the work of Randall Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, when we think about the work of Kelly House, we think about the work of Queen Oli uh, Moore, and uh, certainly Charles Ogletree, mm -hmm. what it shows and what it demonstrates is that, uh, as Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, uh, words are worlds. Mm -hmm. What we write, what we speak, can create the kinds of worlds in which we want to live in. And so, uh, again, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our Trotter Collaborative uh, Advisory Board. And I also want to thank, most importantly, most importantly, uh, the students who are working with you and the Why We Can't Wait Coalition, which, whose name derives from the words of Dr. Martin Luther King with respect to reparations, uh, and who are pressing this issue because we recall that Dr. King said that the change will not arrive on the wheels of inevitability but it might also be said that change will not arrive on the wheels of consensus, mm. right? right. Uh, we, it is our responsibility to bring intellectual insight uh, to these challenges, uh, to write well, to think well, and to advocate well. So with that said, thank you all, and uh, enjoy the night. <laughs>